no one really knows what we believe anymore or who we are anymore and they're grasping at straws for anything to believe in which is why people will be on the on their knees kissing people's shoes over black lives matter this is what communism or marxism call it whatever you like this is what it's all about really it's about controlling human beings we're gonna have to choose between islam and christianity i know which one i prefer when i deal with someone who says that a man is a woman for example and they i think are acting on some sort of faith right so how is it different when you act on on faith with regards to god how is it different if people want to know god spend some time with him so i'm an atheist what do you think of of someone like me is it that i'm i, I i'm failing to see something well, it's not about like which sins have you committed, Calvin. It's more. It doesn't. No, and I don't ask but, it to. to but go, it doesn't make them. It's not on our hearts. Sure, just, but it doesn't make curious. them less of a sin. I'm just curious about your sex life, mate. Well, that's a bit strange. Is there anything that, that new information that could come to light that would make you no longer hold this belief? It feels like mastermind or something. Yes. What What would your mastermind be? My specialist subject. Hmm. Uh, probably Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> I would hope at least. That would be a lot of pressure for a priest though, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, it like, would. If I were a priest, that's the one I would, I'd be like, no, yeah. no, obviously Christianity is to be in case I got that wrong. That's true. Yeah. Do Maybe something. I'd do English history or something. English history. That's an interesting one. Well, well speaking of that then, what is what is your background? Because you're the real deal. You're uh, a priest with, with a very similar suit to mine. Yeah, I quite like your suit actually. Yeah. It feels like we're handing them out. <laughs> like, come here, we put it on like a cloak. Yeah, it's summer, isn't it? You've got yeah. to have the light coloured suit on. A bit of awesome. linen. Um, background how yeah. far back do you want to go i suppose we can go back a little bit for briefly like you know and then and then go into you are actually a priest which is oh, cool because i don't have any other priest friends okay well you've got one now yes um i grew up in the midlands mansfield nottinghamshire a former miners town you know part of sherwood forest robin hood area and we're a very small town well i suppose as far as towns go it's quite big but we're a small knit community compared to where i live now in the center of london um very different experience growing up to what uh, a lot of Zoomers have now in the inner cities. Uh, I think it shaped a lot of my perspective on the world. You know, growing up in, in a kind of environment where everyone knows everyone and everyone holds each other to account. And everyone's kind of, you know, if, if you're a child, other adults would, would set you straight. But also if you're an adult, you'd, you'd hold each other to account and you'd support each other and help each other. Um, moved to London for university. Uh, I did computer games programming for my undergrad. That's right. <laughs> I got into computer games. I got into programming, uh, web apps, mobile apps, and stuff like that. I had some time in industry before teaching it as a teacher, and then eventually found my calling to the faith. That's cool. that's the summary of my background. That's that's <laughs> the life. That's what it is. And and one of the, obviously the topics, particularly in, in in your line of work, both as a as a social commentator and and a priest, that's coming up a lot at the moment is whether a lot of the magical thinking aspects around wokeism are replacing the loss, of, well, start, you know, filling in the void of loss of, Christi of Christianity. Where do you yeah. stand on that? Well, people need something to believe in, right? Everyone needs something to believe in. You can't not believe in something. It's the old adage like either you believe in Christ or you believe in everything. Like you can't believe in nothing at all. So when you remove him, when you remove Jesus Christ from, from the public square, like we have in this so-called Christian country, it's going to be replaced or he's going to be replaced with other stuff. And so we start believing in what, what I would call wokeness or nonsense or liberal progressive values instead of Christian values. And that means we kind of lose our way because for, for centuries, well, pretty much ever since the inception of this country as a, as a nation, we've had a core set of beliefs that pretty much everyone could subscribe to and then with with the influx of mass immigration as well as the uh so we've had the demographic change but as well as the cultural shift away from christianity uh, you know post enlightenment we with those two phenomena we've had what i would call marxism essentially take over and so no one really knows what we believe anymore or who we are anymore and they're grasping at straws for anything to believe in which is why people will be on the on their knees kissing people's shoes over black lives matter or you know police officers will be painting themselves in rainbow colors for the pride parade like people are latching onto whatever they can find to get some sense of belonging and we've got young people in schools, you know, uh, we're reaching a majority now of young people identifying as LGBTQ, which up until this point in history has always been a, a slim minority of the human race. And now it seems to be a majority 
in that even straight people are identifying as queer at the very least in order to fit into this umbrella of wanting to belong and wanting to be liked and wanting to be a part of something. Mm -hmm. I, I know some straight people who do identify as queer. What does that I, mean? I, I get, it's so frustrating because I think if you boil it down, what they're really trying to say is interesting. Mm. Uh, same with non-binary. It's it, so uninteresting, it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a replacement for personality. You're you're a history buff. Tell me, I mean, uh, uh, that's that's, a, that's an intimidating start. Could be anything. So tell oh. me about Nicaragua in 1850. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me about what? Well, look, the Soviet Union, right? Uh, the Bolsheviks. This mm -hmm. was a this was a, a religion free. That was a place where religion was dwindling, yeah. and other beliefs came up in its place, didn't they? Well, they just tried to suppress. Christianity and they, they communists always do this. They always try to suppress uh, Christianity. Look at what's happening in communist China. So they'll say you can learn about Christianity, but you can't learn about the resurrection. Or you can have the Bible without these passages. Hmm. And essentially, they want to take apart the bits that give you hope. And faith is all about hope. Well, the Christian faith is faith, hope, and love. Right, the core tenets, the, the the three cardinal virtues. So removing aspects of it means you don't have the whole package, which means you don't really have the faith. But they, the communists suppress Christianity for the, for the purpose of control. Mm -hmm. And this is what communism or Marxism, call it whatever you like, this is what it's all about really. It's about controlling human beings. And if we believe that we are, we belong to someone greater, to a greater power, if we believe that we are the children of God, then no one can really control us. No one can really suppress us or oppress us. And that's a very dangerous thing to someone who wants to be a tyrannous dictator. Mm. Dawkins and I and Hersey Ali had this discussion. Mm. And Ian said it was imperative we have a religion and that it better be Christianity or is it better off be Christianity than Islam. She's an ex-Muslim for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah. Uh, to, to sort of ward off some of the magical thinking of woke culture and to keep us as a sort of socially cohesive society. Yes. Dawkins, however, said, no, no, we need to teach rational thinking better. Now, might that be a better way to ward off either wokeism or Bolshevikism? But uh, again, this is the enlightenment, isn't it? This is the, we can, we can worship rationality instead of a God. And that essentially means worshiping ourselves and making gods of ourselves. Like we are the ultimate, we are the top tier. There's nothing beyond us. That's a very worrying paradigm because that means, first of all, we, we can take credit for everything, including the, the downfalls of our society, but also we bear the weight of everything. Um, but I think he's, he's onto something in that we do need to teach reason better. We need to teach critical thinking better, absolutely. In our schools, we need to make sure that our kids learn to think for themselves and learn to address situations and, and break them down by first principles so they can argue what they believe in against something that other people believe in. Because we don't have that at the moment. Everyone has to subscribe to one approved narrative. And if someone doesn't, the reason that they're cancelled is because people can't cope. There's no resilience. When you come across someone with a different idea to yourself, it's like, whoa, what, what does this mean? Because you suddenly have to defend your own ideas, and that's hard work if you've never had to do it. And so he's right in that we need to teach reason better, but that's not uh, in the place of faith. Reason and faith go together. You can't have one without the other, because otherwise this is that massive void, and that void will be filled with something. If you don't believe in Christ, you'll believe in everything else or something else. And that means that the woke values, which we've alluded to, they fill that void, but that's only temporarily. Because woke cannot survive on its own. Woke is a self-eating snake, the Oribus. Well, woke is self-cancelling. And we can think of many, many examples between the two of us of people who have been right on up until five minutes ago, and then they've been cancelled by people who were their friends and mm -hmm. contemporaries because they weren't right on enough, or they didn't keep up, or they stuck to one line that was woke for a period, but is no longer woke. Because it, it's constant, it's a cycle that's constantly going on. So it's a set of values you can't actually subscribe to, because you've got to be on the bus with them, you've got to be on the journey with them, because they're heading in some wild destination, but they're not, they're not there yet. And so woke will not survive on its own, woke will destroy itself, which means that that gap, that void that's been left, and I often say, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, that vacuum will be filled with Islam. So Ayan Hirsti Ali is right in that we have to make a choice actually in the West, whether we want to return to Christendom, which is what the West was built on, Europe was built on Christendom, or if we want to become an Islamic caliphate. They are the options. People think we can be a liberal secular society centered on reason and enlightenment principles and, and liberalism. We've tried that. That doesn't work. For the moment, Woke has filled the void, but that void is, as I say, is, is going to fill itself up, and it's going to. We're going to have to choose between Islam and Christianity. I know which one I prefer, but everyone else can set, make their own minds up. So that's really interesting, and I wonder to what extent it's necessary to actually believe in the tenets of the Bible. 
Um, I've got a little a quote here I wanted to read from Alex O'Connor, mm. um, who many will know as another YouTuber. He's an atheist. And I was watching that uh, debate with Dawkins and, and right. Ian in New York, sat next to him. And we had this really interesting thing, because I, th I think because Alex is so used to being the atheist, he's yeah. known as the atheist yeah. guy, he was actually applauding Ian's defense of Christianity more than he was Dawkins' right. defense of atheism, because I think he's just very interested in d disparate oh, thought. Definitely. So he was really fascinated by that, where then I was, I'm a bit more on the atheist sort of, I don't know, so I was like clapping Dawkins louder, and we were, ended up sort of like, hmm, having this sort of rivalry, we were clapping the other But, but even Dawkins has come around to the conclusion now that he would prefer to be culturally Christian that's right. Like, well, that's he, why this. That's why what that right. This, that's on. what this quote is. It. I think it's a really interesting point. Alex, he wrote this in Spikes a couple of days ago. Okay. Uh, in the apocryphal gospel of Thomas, Jesus condemns those who either love the tree and hate its fruit, or love the fruit and hate the tree. Yeah. A regular critique of the nominally religious is that they claim to believe in, say, Christianity, but fail to act in accordance with its demanding message of love and compassion. Mm. They love the tree but can't quite swallow the fruit. More recently, however, a strange reverse phenomenon is emerging: a class of thinkers who, unable to rationally assent to the actual truth of Christianity, mm. and yet disillusioned with the politics of new atheism and fearful of the various religious and pseudo-religious ideas that have filled the vacuum it created, find themselves in the tough spot of being hungry for the fruit, but unable to believe in the existence of the tree. He mm. um, speaks of uh, Douglas Murray, Constantine Kissin, Jordan Peterson. Mm. You know what? I'd include Alex in that category. Mm. Go on. I spent some time with Alex in uh, Nashville. Very nice chap. But um, I think he's very similar to Jordan Peterson and, and the other people you mentioned. They're all on this, this same kind of uh, spectrum, I would say. And, and Alex in particular, in that they recognize the truth. They recognize there is a universal truth. They might even recognize that it, it is Jesus Christ in, in, in regards to Jordan Peterson. But they won't. It's not about reason. He he said people. What was it? He said about reason that they can't reason themselves into it. It's not that that, that reason takes you so far, but but then you have to take a leap of faith. And this is where a lot of these uh, people who are having these conversations about Christianity in the public square at the moment are getting to. They're getting to right up to the precipice. Like they've reasoned as far as they can get. They can understand the historic context of Jesus Christ, the person. They can understand that we want, we're want we better off being a Christian society over an Islamic society or a woke society. They can reason their way all the way to, to understanding that there's lots of truth, beauty, and goodness in Christianity. They can even reason the way into understanding that Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected. But they can't accept that as as a as a an element of faith. They can't just embrace Christ. And it does take that embrace. It just takes that that commitment that, to to Jesus. Are you saying that the people who believe he was res resurrected but still won't embrace? Christ? I'm saying they can get as far as as understanding that that is true without believing it. Uh. They can see that it's one of the most historically documented um, events in history. You know, they can understand that. That, that it's almost impossible to have so many witnesses to one event and it not be true, but to, to believe it to be true is that that's the leap. They, they've got the reason all the way to the edge, but they've got to take that step over. So you, would you say that you believe Jesus was literally died and, and came back to life? Absolutely. Because you're, you're, you're right that Jordan Peterson, he sort of dodges the question. And, and well, it depends what you mean by Jesus. <laughs> like, no. I was waiting for someone to do it. One of us was going to have to do the accent. <laughs> well, you did the Dawkins one, didn't you? So, or was it... I did Dawkins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it's... It doesn't depend what you mean, because we all know what we mean by Jesus. We all know what we mean by resurrection. We we have these fixed terms, and this is what the left do, actually. This is what the woke do, is they try to redefine the terms as you're having the conversation, so they end up disagreeing. You know, they'll say, you're a fascist. You're like, well, what does fascist mean? Because you're obviously using a different, or you're a racist. You're using a different definition mm -hmm. of the word to what we've always used uh, up until five minutes ago. So don't do that. It's disingenuous. And I think that's what certain people on the right are doing now. It depends what you mean by resurrection. It depends what you mean by, no, what we mean by resurrection is literally literally died on the cross was his body was taken to the tomb the stone was put over the doorway and then he came up from the dead and that the stone was no longer there and he was no longer in the tomb he is resurrected from the dead mm. See, uh, yeah i feel like your belief is fairly uh, out, well, among the so social commentators in the minority because because peterson won't say that right and like you say well it depends what you mean by and or hello <laughs> um and, and and then there's um, don't get me wrong i like him i like i like all these people but uh there just needs to be a commitment i think i think he's wonderful jordan Pete. i think he's wonderful uh, uh but sometimes you know you can't agree with everything everyone says and, no. and nor should you um jordan peterson and then um oh, i was thinking of someone else just now as well who's like they seemed i am i am i am as well she seemed to really and and 
Dawkins was confused in that debate because Dawkins thought that she was going to say she's a, she's a cultural Christian and she doesn't right. have any belief. But then she did say she had some belief. Did you get to watch that? I didn't. I've seen clips of it. I've seen write-ups of it. Mm. But I think they're all, the, the, that's a similar spectrum. Like she's further on than I thought she was going to be. I thought she was going to be a cultural Christian yeah. too. I thought Dawkins would be a few steps behind her, but it seems she's a few steps ahead of him, if that makes sense. Yeah, she's really into, but even she wouldn't say, I think that she literally believes that Christ was resurrected. I, I, I suppose what, what's hard for, for, I guess I'll ask you first, what do you think? So I'm an atheist, mm. grew up Jewish, I had a bar mitzvah. Mm. I could do all the stuff, okay. but, but I'm an atheist now. So how did you fall away from your faith? I, I don't think I really ever felt it, okay. but I, it was a community thing, mm. which is, again, speaking to that, I mean, the, the, the Jewish or Christian, whether we talk, call it a Christian or Jewish, this is not a Jewish country, but there are a lot of similarities in sort of culture and community. Of course, because kind of, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, absolutely. Well, there you go. So, so there's going to be a lot of similarities. Yeah, well, I, I definitely felt that community and stuff. And then you get to the bar mitzvah, and I thought, I don't I don't know that I've ever really believed in this stuff. Mm. Uh, and that was it. What do you think of, of someone like me? Is it that I'm... I, I, I'm failing to see something. Well, I don't. I can't speak to uh, to you because I don't know you well enough to, to see what your barriers are. But I think a lot of people put up barriers. Sometimes it's like, like the people we just discussed. It's their own intellect that gets in the way, and they expect to, to be reasoned into it or to to science to point them to it. Um, but for some people, it's just a case of they haven't actually considered looking. For many people, they haven't considered whether God is true and and Jesus Christ was you know died and resurrected. Um, I think. We all know there is a God. I think truly we're all born with him printed on our hearts. We all have a, a knowledge of, some people call it the universe, some people call it spirituality. You know, I, I think we're, we're all born with the knowledge of God imprinted on our hearts, but it's about finding him and it's about letting him in. And sometimes that just means sitting in a quiet room for a while and asking him to let him know that he exists, to let you know that he is real. Do, do you, is it like a person... I used to have a, I had a recurring dream when I was a child and that I died and then God was sort of just a face. It was like, right. a, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know why that is. And then right. I remember being surprised later to read that God walks in the, the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Walks. Oh, he's got yeah. legs. What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, what does it mean? Do you, is God a person? I mean, God is three persons in one being, in one Godhead. So he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that's a mystery that is beyond our comprehension, but that's how he has revealed himself to us. And so we have a. This is some of the difference, differences between Judaism and Christianity. In that Judaism would will, will probably have a relationship with God the Father, like as a, a detached uh, patriarch who provides, uh, you know, his law and his good order for us to live by. But in Christianity, we also get a personal relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ, and that means we can be a bit more intimate, and we we understand him. We both understand him to, to be a living God, but in Christianity, he is with us, present. And we can receive him bodily and really and truly in the Eucharist. So there, there's a there's a depth to to Christianity that has kind of evolved, really. What's nice is that I I did a I've done a few polls on my channel, and it turns out that about fifty percent are religious. Okay, which is it's nice to know because it's not like if I'm disagreeing with you, I'm doing it in like aha, we're all getting you, and the audience is disagreeing because a lot of people uh, will be completely on board and loving sure. what what you're saying. It's so hard for me to get onto that idea of a. Yeah. A person or God, he's what is he watching us now? Is he watching everyone at once? Is he a he? Does that even make sense? Well, he's he's asked us to refer to him with the he him pronouns, sure. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's let's not restrain him to the idea of 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 he's like you or I. He is far greater. He is omnipresent and omnipotent. He is that he is beyond our comprehension. So the, the asking questions like is he here now? Can is he watching us now? Kind of. That restrains him to our own, you know, three or four dimension phys physicality. It's like when people say, you know, if, how does God does God know what I'm going to do right now? It's like, well, God isn't in time. God created time. God created time and space. So he's not watching us like we're watching a television. Like he's outside. He's beyond that. And I know that's a, that's a very difficult thing to get our heads around, but that's the truth. I think what's what's I, I guess when I deal with someone who says that a man is a woman, for example, I, I would say that is it Carl Sagan that old extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and mm. it's not for it's not for them to shout you're a transphobe. It's for me to say no, no, you've said something yeah. fucking insane. Yeah. You need to come and prove this to me uh, yeah. really well. It has to be really well done, uh, and they I think are acting on some sort of faith. Right. So how is it different when you act on on faith with regards to God? How is it different? Yeah, they're acting on faith that there's a, a man can be a woman. You go why? Because I feel it. 
I feel it. On oh, I sp- oh, I see what you mean. Well, I suppose because we've we've asked for proof as people. We've said, you know, we we need we need evidence that our God is real and living, and so He came to Earth as a man, as God incarnate, and uh, as we've accomplished, we, there is more historical data on the Jesus Christ as the person, as as pretty much every, any other person throughout history. So we know that He was real. Hmm. And he he revealed himself to us, and then he died for us, and continued to reveal himself to us. So I, I suppose we've asked for that proof, and we've been given it. Mm-hmm. But he's he's always been doing that since the beginning of time. He walked with us in the Garden of Eden. He revealed himself to Moses in the in the in the bush, the burning bush. So, and I suppose we can always have that relationship. We can always communicate with him through prayer. I've always felt before I was a Christian, I've always felt there was a God, and I've always communicated, I've always prayed to to God. And I've always felt my prayers were answered. And I know so many people have been through that faith journey. Like, if people want to know God, spend some time with him. You know, just shut down your devices, find a silent, quiet space, because he says, be still and know that I'm the Lord. And then just pray and ask him, reveal yourself to me, Father. How many quotes have you just got, like, ready? I don't, I don't know. I read the Bible several times a day. So Do it's, you really? It's, yeah, we, we, should, we all should be doing that. That's so, extraordinary. Well, eventually, it will, parts of it will stick with you. I don't know it. I, know, I, can't, I can quote every part of the Bible, but certainly the bits that uh, stand out to me. I'm always amazed by the ability to remember quotes. I, I don't know how actors do it, particularly in the theatre, an entire play. It's, it's yeah. absurd. I cannot, when we do, I read out an ad or something. Yeah. I can't even, I'll look down and it's like four <laughs> words that I've written and I have to redo it about 50 times. So just to have these quotes to heart. Um, and and I, suppose, I suppose one of them that I can't remember ever is uh, Bertrand Russell, which was something along the lines of uh, don't, don't believe what you wish would, true for society or would be good for society, society were it true mm. but rather just look only at the facts and, and, and science and mm. th- those kinds of things and, but, but would you say no he's missing an extra jump no I mean that's a good starting point science reveals the world science reveals the knowledge that God already, already has so it's a, it's a way of exploring his creation science is very important and most of the, the uh, landmark scientific revelations came from Christians you know mm. the this, this, this scientific method is, is a Christian method essentially what if Christ had been, I mean, what if 2,000 years ago there had been a David Blaine? I'm sure you've thought of this, like a magician, if no one knows who David Blaine is, or uh, who's, who's the other, Darren Brown? Uh, Darren Brown. You, you would think back then before there was so much technology and those kinds of things, it, you know, people fall for those kinds of things. Sure, but I mean, people witnessed the miracles. People witnessed people dying and, and knew the people that you know, knew Lazarus and then saw him resurrected. And people touched Christ's wounds after you know Saint Thomas after he died, um, people were fed with a basket of you know five loaves and um, bits of bread to, to five thousand people. Or was it seven loaves? See, there, that's where my memory is playing up. Yeah, um, rubbish priest. <laughs> yeah, but uh, there are so many witnesses to so many miracles, and the miracles haven't stopped. The miracles happen every single day. So, what kinds of things? Well, small miracles to large miracles. Um, A small miracle might be uh, happening to be in in the right place at the right time. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe in God's divine providence and his design, his good order. And, you know, over the last few days, I've I've met, I I don't want to go into people's personal stories, but, but I've met so many people on this faith journey just from wearing the collar. People that may not even know me from the industry or media or whatever, just recognize the collar and see a person in Christ. And they've needed to have a conversation with a person who is a person in Christ in that time, in that moment. So many times that you, you're able to, to relate to someone as a fellow human being, as a fellow brother in Christ and a fellow um, child of God when they've needed it and they've been going through something and it's changed something in their life, just being able to relate with you and to you. Uh, and to him through you that I, I can't not believe in those miracles but then you've got the bigger miracles of people that are suffering or dying or going through something and you pray and they, and they are healed and science and doctors cannot attest to how or why when you say you don't believe in coincidence I mean you're yeah. you, you must believe in in the concept of probability and when you've got seven billion people all running around you know it would be mad if a coincidental or seemingly coincidental event didn't sometimes happen when I say I don't believe in coincidence, I mean that I don't believe things happen by accident. I don't believe that, you know, when I bumped into you in the streets in on St. James's the other that day. That was mad. There was a reason for that. That was completely insane. But we are not necessarily to know the reason. It might be that so that we could have this conversation today. And it might be that some seed is planted today and either you or me that later we realize, oh, that's why I needed to meet him at that point. Mm. But like, I'm coming out of the studio with Lawrence. I'm bumping to Andrew Gold. I'm like, okay, this is strange. What's going on? So, but I, I would say that wasn't 
just accidental. That was part of a grand plan. But my point is that we don't always know what that plan is or our place in that plan. It was we have to trust there is a plan. Completely insane for anyone not. Because I had already been speaking to Lawrence, it makes it even weirder because Lawrence was coming on my po- on this podcast a few days later uh, and I was walking to meet Winston Marshall. I like this because it gives the view, look at us with this incestuous bunch. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All of us in the, in the exclusive club. Yeah. yeah, I was going to meet Winston to, for, to see his new cigar line or whatever. Yeah. And then I, th- I thought you guys must have been there. I just saw you and Lawrence on the street. Yeah. And then you, I mean, you must have thought I was a, f- a fan or something. Like, oh, guys, guys, <laughs> jumping down the street. And it was, it was you. And uh, you weren't there for Winston. It was just Complete. No. That's where you were filming um, Fox and the Father, is it? Father, Fox yeah. and the Father, yeah. Fox and Father. Winston's a good friend of ours, mutual friend of ours. So it was strange that he was a few doors down. We didn't know. Mm. Uh, and we didn't know that was where you were going. A but, massive city. It, right. that, that was remarkable. How many? Six million people? Or was it 60 million people? I don't know how many people there are. Uh, but in London, right, a billion. <laughs> I don't know. It feels like a billion, doesn't it? I think it's something like eight or nine. I think we've imported a eight or nine million in the last Bloody few hell. years. It's, well, it's gone up. It has it gone up. It feels like it. It has gone up. And it's it's such an old man thing for me to say, and I'm only 35, but it you do walk down the streets. And, and the reason I notice it so much is because half of my family is Argentinian now. Right. I have sort of in-laws and stuff, and I've married in Argentina. I lived there for years. And they've, they come over, and yeah. they're like, they're, they're amazed because they're in London. Like, is anyone actually from England? Yeah, there are no Brits in London anymore. Yeah, British, but, White Brits are in a minority in the capital city, which I think is baffling. Yeah. But then in America also, I mean, it's mostly Latino. There's a lot of Latinos there. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's not such, maybe it's not a bad thing. Well, I think it is a bad thing because we have to have a predominant culture. And to have a predominant predominant culture, you have to have a predominant ethnicity. Uh, Otherwise, there's no nation state. Like you can be for immigration if you like, but you have to have something for people to integrate into, is my point. Multiculturalism doesn't work because you just erode the predominant ethnicity and the predominant culture. And so it becomes nothingness, just a bland, you know, you've got ghetto here for. Bangladeshis, ghetto there for Pakistanis, ghetto there for Somalis. Great. What does? How does that help the Somalis, the Bangladeshis, or the Pakistanis? How does it help the Brits? It doesn't, because everyone's living their own lives in their own communities. And so that's not to say multi-ethnicity can't work, that you can't have different people of different faiths, different creeds, different skin colors all living together. But there has to be a predominant culture and a predominant faith and a predominant nation. And would you say immigration is happening at such a speed right now and from not necessarily places that have much in common with our culture that this is a concern yeah a massive concern london is already lost i'm moving out of london next week lawrence is moving out of london next week i moved out of london really yeah this is it no one wants to be here anymore and so on the one hand we're saying well there are no brits left in london on the other hand the brits are moving out of london because we're them because there are no brits left <laughs> although yeah oh man it's it's a really complicated one what what are some of the things that are going back to the beginning of the conversation about some of the i guess the the woke beliefs that have now replaced mm. old fashioned christian beliefs well i mean there's so many so the idea that a man can become a woman mm. now this has obviously been a long process starting with feminism um, which is a form of critical theories, which is a form of liberalism, which is a form of Marxism. They're all, all these things are related, and people probably argue in the comments, no, that's this, that's that, doesn't matter. They're all related. The fact of the matter is that somewhere along the lines, people started saying, for a woman to become equal to a man, she has to become like a man, right? So she has to go to work like men do, and she has to work in the same fields as men, she has to do the same things as men, she has to become a provider and protector just as men do, uh, as strong as men, as much testosterone as men quite often. And that's not healthy, that's not right, it's not good. We used to have a world where men did the hard uh, physical labor, men were the providers and protectors, women were the, considered the fairer sex and they were more nurturing, uh, they were more mothering. And so they were homesteads, they, they looked after the home and they looked after the children, they educated and nurtured and cared for the, the next generation. And that was and feminism said that's a bad thing. First of all, it said no. There's a, there's a there's a good alternative. You can do that, or you can go out to work. And then it started to say no. You have to go out to work. Otherwise, you're against other feminists. And that's the traditionalism is a bad thing. And so what we ended up with is women becoming like men. And then of course the natural progression of that was that well, if women can become like men, what's to stop men from becoming like women? And we lost chivalry. We lost treating women in a certain manner with certain respect you know you, you go on the london underground go on any public transport and you'll see pregnant women never mind just women and elderly women standing up because men do not give up the seats anymore not because they don't want to so quite often they still want to but they'll be chastised if they do and so men have become effeminate in, in many many ways and so th- th- we've got a whole generation of young men and women that haven't had a strong male role model 
and we've got lots of fatherlessness. We've got lots of single single mother households, and I'm not b- being disparaging against single mothers, but saying there is an ideal of one mo- one mother, one father in a household. That's the best situation, and without that, we have detrimental effects. As in children under the age of 18 whose family has a breakdown, oh, th- these children are twice as likely to end up in prison, twice as likely to end up uh, on drugs, and and twice as likely to end up in crime. These are facts. These are statistics. Mm. But anyway, uh, so so men have become effeminate, women have become masculated, and then of course the next step after that is well, if women can become like men, and men can become like women, what is the difference between men and women? There is no difference. They are the same. They are interchangeable, and therefore men can become women. And therefore, men should be invited into women's spaces. Why shouldn't they? Because we're all equal. We're all the same. We're all interchangeable. And then you have the whole trans movement. People with autogynophilia, these people with perverse kinks who get excited from pretending to be women, go into women's safe spaces and essentially abuse women. And it's, it's a toxic, disgusting atmosphere. And then we've got young children being told this is okay. Maybe you're in the wrong body. Maybe you are a boy instead of a girl or a girl instead of a boy and confusing young minds. And of course, kids want to fit in, and so they're all latching onto this stuff, and all of it. I'm, I'm going all over the place with this, but essentially, all of that comes from the denial of the fact that we are made in the image of God, and He made us male, and He made us female, and that men are there to serve God, and women are there to serve men, and there is a, a com- there's a complementary relationship that men are to love their wives, and women and wives are to be obedient to their husbands. And this is this is the Christian message that worked for millennia. Man, okay, there's a lot to unpack there, yeah, and, I, and so much that I agree with as well. Mm. Um, we're in a really tough bind, I think, philosophically. Mm. Even just taking religious uh, religion out of it for a second, just looking at how we want society to be. And I'm a big believer in individual liberty; that individuals should be able to live the lives they want to live without uh, pressure from outside. Too much pressure, you have to do this or that, which I think is what you're saying as well, to a degree. I, yes. I do believe in social stigma. Okay, yeah. Sure. So, which you need a bit, you need a, yeah. a bit of a mix. Um, I, I'm a big, a big one on individual liberty because I just think I, maybe it does come down to religion because I think you only have one life. That's what I feel. So, a woman born today has one life, mm. and she might not want to spend it being obedient to, to her husband mm. she might not want to spend it doing things that women expect women she might want to be ambitious and really get everything she can and, and do a job and do all these things so and, what a waste of a life <laughs> well but, the difficult the difficult the paradox here is that the statistics do show i've seen what you're talking about which is that when you don't have a stable family unit when you don't have a um the, the children do not prosper they don't do very well no. and i just think my my opinion on that is okay we have to find a way to try and make things fit which is difficult and there is an objective good and an objective truth. And this, this, if you believe in that, it shifts this whole conversation because it's all right to say, yeah, do whatever you like. Fine, people should be able to do what they like to some regard, but not, not absolutely. But also they should be guided in that because if you say, okay, do what you like, you, know, you as a woman, go and work 50 hours a week, be incredibly successful, and then come back and talk to me when you're 79 on your deathbed and what would the conversation be? Would it be, oh, I wish I'd have spent even more hours in work trying to make even more money that I can't take with me? That you say the same to men. Well, we, absolutely, but I'll, but I get to men. But the point is, without the guidance of saying, actually, these are not good things, like chasing wealth, chasing ambition, uh, chasing men's roles is is not going to fulfill you. It might make you, you might find temporary temporary happiness along the way, but that's that's fleeting, and it won't you won't feel contented and you won't feel fulfilled. Here is a better way. Here is the God's good order. This is the way that's been set out for us. Create a good home. Create a good family. Raise a good family. Um, be a good wife. Be a good mother. And then for, for many, it's exactly the same. J- chasing a career, chasing money, chasing worldly goals, you will have the same emptiness on your deathbed if you're not providing for a family, creating a good home, creating a good family, or contributing to society, contributing to the community. You can There can be some alignment in these things, and that you can be successful and provide for a community. You know, you can build a good charity, and you can become personally successful as well as corporately successful. There are ways to align these objectives, but unless you have some guidance, you're lost and you're on your own, and you can end up isolated, lonely, depressed, unhappy, and that's sad. Nobody wants that for anybody. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that beliefs form not necessarily in the pursuit of accuracy. We form our beliefs actually based on incentives and peer pressure. So if you are with a bunch of woke friends, it's it's there's an incentive to believe that men can become women because you're going to get a good reaction from your friends. Yeah. Everyone loves you, that kind of thing. With regards to religion, and not just Christianity, but every religion, it does seem to end up with that thing of women should serve men. 
and it, often the books are written by men. So could it not be that men have written these books as a way of controlling women? I mean, it's, quite, it's pretty nice, isn't it? We can have just women serving us. Well, I mean, it could be that way. Sure, it could be. But let's look at what worked for, for the whole of human history in that people were more contented, more fulfilled, and, more, and actually happier when men knew that they had to go out and potentially die for the family. And women knew that they, they stayed home and looked after the family and were safe. And that's an objectively good thing. It's not about oppression. It's not about you must serve me. It's about you you serve the the family in the household and i will serve you too it's a, it's a working together but it's not working together in the way that they are two equals as in they're interchangeable it's not like okay so the woman goes out and chops down trees and the man stays at home and raises the children that is a disordered way but we're told that that's that's fine because men and women are the same and we're equal and everything's but we're not we're not the same we are very different mm. we handle like we well, think differently. We handle things differently. Like men are literally physically stronger, faster, and mentally more logical and pragmatic. Women are fairer, as in they're slower, uh, but they're also more emotionally intelligent, and which is which what makes them a better nurturing person. Would you want your your children, if you had children, would you would like daughters to to grow up, and and that's their only ambition to look after a, a family? I can't think of a, a better ambition. There's nothing. There's no better vocation than being a mother. Like, what is better in this world than raising good kids? Well, yeah, I agree with you there. Um, <laughs> you've argued that premarital sex is a sin. Absolutely. Um, I was going to ask, I just, just a personal question. <laughs> just going to ask about when you were younger, before before maybe you'd been a priest and all of that, if that's something you would have engaged in. Can I ask you that? I don't want to make it sort of uh, by yourself. You, you can ask, but I think it, it undermines it's the question because it's not about like which sins have you committed, Calvin? It's more, it doesn't. No, and I don't ask but, it to, to but go, it doesn't make them, it's not on our hat. Sure, just, but it doesn't I'm make them less of a sin. Just curious about your sex life, mate. Well, that's a bit strange. <laughs> but, no, it's a good point actually because we spend far too much time talking about each other's sex lives, and no, not just us. Just so anyone before no, the camera general, was on. In general, it's yeah. how people define themselves now by who they're who they're sexually attracted to. That's perverse. I've, I've, I I agree. It's, I mean, I would I would use the word boring. It's it's boring. It is, I think it's boring, but it's also perverse. Like I don't need to know who you're sexually attracted to, or who you're sleeping with, or who you're not sleeping with. Like, it's, what? That's gross. Mm. That's nothing to do with me. Like, keep that in your bedroom. Yeah. Uh, even you know, but the 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 point of the, of the question is that sin is sin, regardless of who does it and who preaches on it or who teaches on it, it, it because sin is what's given to us. Um, in the in the good book as in there are things that are good and the things that are not good and the things that are not good are sinful because they're not good for us and so sex outside of marriage is a good example because the whole per it brings up the question of what's the purpose of sex so the purpose of sex is between a married man and a woman for procreation to to be two becoming one flesh united under god open to being blessed by god with children and that's for the greater good of them the, the, that that couple to start a family it's great good of the community to have more people we need more people in the community and it's great good of god for the greater good of god because he has more people to worship him and so there are lots of consequences uh, to to the sexual act but once you take that away from the marital couple it just becomes about personal desire personal pleasure which is lust which is a sin because there's no there's no ends to it to that it's just a means without an ends and that's the same with anything you know food is wonderful food is well can be wonderful if it's cooked right and tastes mm. right but it's it's to to it's for sustenance right it's so you can you get energy it's a fuel but the moment you overindulge in food you're eating it just for the taste like you're already full but you're gonna have some more and then some more and some more it becomes a sin because it's not about it's not for your body anymore it's your own personal desires and pleasures and that's why we have uh, things to avoid because it's not good for us like the, in the same way that, that pornography is, uh, is is a direct result of, of sex being taken outside of marriage because it's all about the, the personal pleasure of the individual. Like why should you not spend all day watching pornography? Well, because it's going to rot your brain. It's going to affect the way you look at men or women, depending on who you are. It's going to ch change your relationships. It's going to change your chemical levels. You know, you're not going to have as much testosterone. It's, it's going to make you a irritable, lonely, isolated person. So there, there are detrimental effects to sinning. But this this is probably one of the reasons that God has told us to avoid sin. See, as you speak, and you speak profoundly about such important topics, I can't help but think that where we, if we if we were to debate this, the fundamental disagreement at the beginning of it is the belief in God. Yeah, and you go one way or the other depending on your belief yeah. there. So for me, it's like, hey, pleasure. I'm going to be dead in like 30 years, and that's it. Lights out. 
get my I'm going to fill my boots. If a guy wants to fuck a guy up the ass, do you know? You're right. No, what I don't if want you're it. not? What if there's something afterwards? And what if you're judged on everything you've done up until that point? That's that's exact. That's my point. So if you believe that from the starting point. It's, it's almost like with that, we, we can't really have that debate because what you say does follow if you have those beliefs. And with my belief, I think, I mean, if you believe what I believe, which is that there is no God. But even, even if, you're, if I did believe that, there, I would st- still be able to understand that there are certain things that are good for us and certain things that are not good for us. And we should avoid the things that are not good for us. Oh, more or less. But I mean, again, individuals, I believe, should have the right to make their own mistakes. Which we do, which is why God gives us free will. It doesn't make them good, though. Mistakes no. aren't good, are they? Objectively, mistakes are bad. No, but there are 7 billion people on the planet who will all respond differently to different things. So while I agree that in general, it has been shown statistically, for example, that a man and a woman, who are, uh, a mother and father, right. will uh, raise a child with better prospects. Um, I'm absolutely sure there are individual cases. Where sure, but that's the, not the outlier does not prove the rule. That's the, 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 no, the, but the outlier are, is, the uh, exception does not become the rule. That's the problem. So the, the overeaters, the, the morbidly obese... They get a, an instant pleasure from eating. They like it. Yeah. Now, there are some influencers online who, who overindulge as a habit, and they record it, and they get lots of viewers. They make lots of money from it. So they're enjoying the taste. They're enjoying the success. They're, they're meeting, meeting all those things you talked about, ambition, et cetera. But surely you and I can sit here today and say that's still objectively not good mm-hmm. for them, even, yeah. even though they like it. I can definitely agree with that. And I, I definitely agree that too, yeah, too much and, and not enough discipline is a huge problem and, and also uh the veneration at the moment or the, the cheering on of any kind of i don't care i just do whatever i want is is not a good way to grow up so i think we could definitely agree there what about in terms of how literally you might take the bible let's say mm. would you stone adulterers that's a that's a common example um the bible doesn't teach christians to stone adulterers Right. Well, I haven't read it, so do yeah. Let, let me. What what is? But there are two different questions. How literally do you take the Bible? Well, you take it. Well, either you you, you believe it's true or you don't. So, it's, there is this whole modern concept that you know some people are fundamentalists and they take the Bible too literally, and you should actually just use it as a well, no. It's either you you think it's true or you don't. Right. I agree. But the Bible is full of books. It is a library of books. Some of them are, are anecdotal. Some are allegorical. Some are poems. Uh, some are stories. Some are just straight up advice. Some are rules and commands. And so, it, you know, I wouldn't take the, the the poems literal in the same way that I take the list of commands mm. literally. So, it, so the actual question doesn't really make much sense when you think about it properly. Um, but I think what you're trying to get to is: is do you follow all the rules of the Bible, or should all the rules of the Bible be followed? Like, and yes, all the, but we have to remember that the new covenant fulfills the old. And so Christians aren't to live by the old law in the same way that Jews do. The cr- Christian Christian law is is slightly different. Oh, so you wouldn't take in some of the Old Testament one bits? Right. Some of the Old Testament was for the Jewish people, and some of the Old Testament was for a time and a place, whereas the entirety of the New Testament is for all Christians at all time. But it's not that the Old Testament has been replaced or removed, but it's been fulfilled and updated. I see. I knew someone once who was doing He was trying to live for a year um, as though he took the Bible, but Old and New Testament, yeah. literally, which was which was very difficult, obviously, to do in the modern age. And his wife used to wind him up a bit by uh, if, she'd, if she'd been on her period, she'd sit in a certain in all the seats in the, right. the house, so he had nowhere to sit when he got home. And but it's it's not something you do because, like, the Old Testament says men should be circumcised, and the New Testament says, well, unless you were born Jewish, you shouldn't be circumcised. So, right. so, and the Bible can't contradict itself, so we follow. So I suppose he was just doing a sort of test and seeing what he could do. And he actually found he he started to have because he was he didn't he wasn't I don't think an atheist, he was just didn't really think too much about religion. And by the end he he did become religious just mm-hmm. simply by adhering to all of the rules. Do you know how common this is? And especially there have been a lot of journalists that have tried to investigate Christianity and tried to disprove it, and they always end up becoming Christian. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I'd be the exception. Try it. I, you I know what? Because I would love, and I said this to Lawrence as well when he came and I said I would love to have that belief. And mm. it sounds patronizing to say, and I don't know how to say it in a way no. that doesn't sound, but I would love it. I would feel so good about it. It's freeing. Oh, yeah. And then the next life, I can do the next thing. Well, uh, I don't um, have to think about what's right or wrong. I don't have to think about what's good or bad. I have it in front of me. Hmm, so I, just, I try to follow it. That, tr- following it is difficult, of course, but I, it takes me out of it. It's not about me. It's not about my personal wants, desires, my personal interpretation. It's about what God te- reveals to us and what the church teaches. Is there anything that, that new information that could come to light that would make you no longer hold this belief? 
that's like saying, it, could the truth ever become a lie? You could find out, for example, that the Bible was written by like a prankster. I don't think we could. I, I don't think I accept the premise of that because I think we've we've understood that the we don't. I mean, we, there was a time before we had a Bible, and we still had the Christian faith. The Christian, the, the sacred scriptures come from sacred tradition. Like the, the faith was handed down to us from Christ Himself, from God Himself in the person to his apostles. And then we have something called apostolic succession and they pass that composite of knowledge uh, down to what we call the bishops today. And so it's been handed on generation to generation. And after a few years, they started to write it down and we've got the scriptures for that reason. So I don't, I don't think that will be achievable. Why were you suspended by GB News? Because <laughs> they're wet. <laughs> <laughs> they're wet? Yeah. <laughs> what does wet mean? Like, it's like, like pathetic. I mean, it, <clears throat> When it set, when they started GB News, it was set up as a as a good idea to give an alternative voice, alternative platform. Um, we could probably find people who would agree or disagree on whether they've achieved that, but I mean, the story is that my friend said something perhaps inappropriate but not illegal on air. He was punished for that and fired for that. <clears throat> the person whose show he was on, another friend of mine, was suspended because of that for something that someone else said. Hmm. And I said, well, look, we can't call ourselves the home of free speech and cancel two of our own guys for saying something that some people deem offensive but is very legal um, and not breaking any guidelines. What's, like, how can we be the home of free speech? We're clearly... We're, we should... I mean, I agree with you actually on that, but I, I wonder if there is a limit somewhere. Is there something that a presenter on the TV show that would have been unbecoming of the channel that they could have said that was so Sure, offensive? but then you have to have that limit explicitly somewhere, don't you? you have, if there's a line, people have to know what that line is. And if, if that line is saying, I wouldn't shag that, hmm. then that's a very narrow line. And, th and the problem was it, was it was obviously a two-tiered thing because there were lots of women saying the exact same thing on on the BBC and across other mainstream mm -hmm. platforms and there were no consequences whatsoever. So this She was, had been, hadn't she? Um, uh, Ava Santana. Yeah, but Carol that. Vorderman said it and other people said it and there were no consequences for them. But Carol Vorderman was the one who led the campaign. She said to people on her massive platform, press this link, fill out an Ofcom complaint, get these people fired. This is cancel culture. They don't like us. It's not about what he said. It's about who he is. And this is, this is the problem. But for me, a company like GB News should back its people and we should support each other, and we should stand for the principles that we say we stand for. Otherwise, they hold all the power. The enemy holds all the power, and therefore there's no point existing. And now, since they fired the three of us, no one's going to speak up on that channel properly. They're only going to, they're going to only operate within that narrow field because they're going to be afraid of getting fired themselves and or the woke lot coming after them. And they know that whenever the woke lobby puts pressure on, that mob is going to have all the power because the, the management of GB News have shown them that that's what happens. You could say it's not a huge loss to GB News that their presenters can't make those kinds of comments about women. About no, I say it's a massive loss. It's a fundamental loss in that the platform no longer can call itself free, a free speech platform. But as we said, there has to be a limit somewhere anyway. There has to be, a, you know... A, a yeah, but they still haven't there. shown what their limit is. And they've shown that <laughs> actually, if people don't like, if people on the woke left don't like what is said, doesn't matter what it is, then they can get rid of you. So it's, it's, the, it's actually broken the idea of the channel. I said to Lawrence, he shouldn't have said that. And I think he said that you told him he shouldn't sure, have said that. Sure, but that's beyond the point. Like, mm. if, if, if he says something inappropriate, then either get him to apologize for it, if he, if he agrees that it's inappropriate, or find a sanction. But you don't fire him for it if he's, if he's done, if, if just because a few people have taken offense. And then you don't fire the, peop the person whose show he was on for it. You don't fire the person who's saying that this is wrong to be firing these people for it. Like, it's, it's, it's just beyond that, well, that, that's the That's what I think is a bit, a bit mad. And I mean, Dan was just, just sort of smiling. Well, Dan had an awkward smile on his face. Yeah. Like, he's, clearly, this is my friend. He said something inappropriate. What do I say in this moment? Well, do I, I challenge him in, on live right. TV? Do I challenge awkward. him now or do I have a conversation later? Do I get him to apologize at the end of the show? You can see a million things going yeah. through his head at that moment. It's beyond ridiculous odd. to fire him. I feel like they fired, They wanted to fire him for some other thing. Absolutely, they did. Yeah. It's never about the thing that it's about, is it? No, it's not. Um, we've got, I've got another question to ask you, but first, tell me where can people follow you and all of that stuff? Um, CalvinRobinson.com is the best place to find me. That's my sub stack. But I've got a show with Lawrence Fox called Fox and Father. That's on Reclaim the Media on Thursdays at 7 p.m. I've got Calvin's Common Sense Crusade, which is the show that I originally had on GB News. That's now on the LotusEaters.com on Thursdays at 3 p.m. live. Um, I do my sub stack and... 
You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. All the social media is just Calvin Robinson. Calvin Robinson. Easy to find. People do go and find him. Calvin, he's got a great, interesting opinion. It's different to what you might expect anywhere else. So Perfectly ordinary follow. opinions from 10 minutes ago. Yeah, well, there's that as well. <laughs> but but good, but interesting opinions and, and, and not opinions that, you know, they're opinions that uh, a lot of people like myself might balk at mm. immediately, mm. Uh, initially, and then listen and go, okay, okay, look, I'm, I, and you and I are never going to agree on, on God. I think that's... Don't that's say just, never. We'll see. Well, you might come round. You're right. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> who is a heretic you admire? De- define heretic because you and I probably have a different opinion on what that means. I think it, I, I think I want you to define it how you want. Okay. So I, if I was talking about a heretic, I'd be talking about someone who thinks they're a Christian but teaches a falsehood. Oh, so in a negative sense. Yes. So I, I think that's great. I think let's do because so, uh, unless you really wanted like a hero to talk about a hero. Well, I wouldn't admire a heretic because I think heresy is a bad thing because there is an objective truth and God has revealed that truth to us and it's our job to proclaim it. Well, you're talking to about share uh, it. Oh, so, okay. Well, that's why you want me to define heresy because yeah, I suppose I think heresy initially opinion. was about religion. That's why we have these kind of. So wooden, I imagine for you, tables. it's like a disruptor or someone who's speaking out against the approved narrative of the mainstream media or something like that, it, right? Yeah. Or, or it could have been a religion it could be anything like someone who's like oh that person had the balls to stand up and i like him or you can tell me someone you don't like who's who stood up for okay. religion so in the public square someone who's had the kahunas to stand up uh, against the approved narrative consecutive consistently i would say tommy robinson interesting tommy robinson has been painted as the boogeyman as the voldemort for like 20 years now and I've looked into what he said, I had conversations with him, and I found out actually all he was doing was trying to protect his country and his, and his people. You know, he saw Pakistani Muslim rape gangs 10 years before it was in the media, tried to get it addressed, nobody was interested, and he was admonished for it. And uh, the, the elite hate him because he exposes them for the shills and the complacent fools that they are. Tommy Robinson, the heretic. People, please do go follow Calvin Robinson and all the places he said. Uh, we'll put descriptions, uh, links down in the description. Hit that like and subscribe button and keep watching. We'll put something similar, although there's no one quite similar to Calvin. Uh, <laughs> I don't, right here. <laughs>